Hey guys, Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground. Now, before we jump in this episode, I wanted to take just a few minutes to share with you all a ministry update. Really haven't done this in a few months, and uh, we've got a lot of uh, exciting news, a lot of breaking news, and things that uh, I wanted to share. So before we jump into the actual program, I wanted to just uh, give everyone an update. So first of all, we've got a few projects that we'll be breaking here over the next few weeks and months. Um, I actually have three books that I'll be releasing between now and the spring of 2019. We'll have three different books as well as some DVD teaching series, some classes. So let me begin with the first one. The first book um, will actually be out toward the middle, uh, about the middle toward the end of November. And this is a book that has been in the works, in the hopper, really for probably about two years now. And I've probably mentioned it in passing a couple times, but really haven't given you all very much information. But I'm excited to announce that this book is now finally all edited. Um, and it will be released here pretty quick. Um, We're just ready to go to the printer. So the title of the book is The Mystery of Catastrophe, Understanding God's Redemptive Purposes for the Global Disasters of the Last Days. Now, this is a book that I've co-authored with a dear friend named Nathan Graves. Uh, Nathan is a, has been a missionary in Albania for about 25 years, and I've known him for about four years now, four or five years. Um, he works in the Balkans, okay, so the part of the world that um, most Americans don't really know all the different countries. Of course, they know Greece and maybe Bulgaria, but this is the Balkan Peninsula. You've also got Macedonia, uh, soon to be likely called uh, the Northern Republic of Macedonia. You've got Bosnia and Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, Herzegovina, Croatia. Um, you know, quite a few different nations over there. And so he's been working in a, in a pretty um, difficult part of the world um, because there's a tremendous amount of uh, racial, religious division over there. Um, during the 1990s, there were three separate wars that led to about 150,000 deaths in that part of the world and really the breakup um, of the Balkan Peninsula into all of these different smaller republics and nations. And it was during this time that Nathan was sort of plunged right into the midst of all of this, a sort of the baptism of fire, um, entering the, the, the world of being a missionary. And it's out of a lot of the lessons that he's learned from those years, as well as um, the partnership that he and I had the past few years in terms of getting the Bible into the hands of tens of thousands of refugees as they were making their way, the Muslim refugees making their way from the Middle East up through the Balkans on sort of that refugee highway, making their way toward Western Europe. And many of you actually partnered with us in that, in donating toward uh, filling these micro SD cards with the Bible, with all sorts of Christian literature, with different things in the languages of those who were coming from the Middle East. and. Um, Nathan was uh, part of this project, working with all sorts of different churches, evangelical churches throughout the Balkans, to get these micro SD cards into the smartphones of many of these refugees that were pouring through. And uh, even to this day, we're still hearing testimonies of the good things that came out of that project, of Muslims that uh, came to faith and became followers of Jesus that are now making disciples themselves. And so some of you uh, may be familiar with some of this, uh, the backstory in this project as we did a few shows here on the underground. And so this is the Nathan um, that I co-authored the book with. Now, I'll actually be interviewing Nathan and having him on the show here uh, real soon, and we'll talk quite a lot more. Um, about this particular project. So that's exciting. Now, in partnership with that, what we're wanting to do is actually take you to some of these churches and to meet some of these believers that have come to faith. You know, because again, we hear about the negative with regard to the global Muslim refugee epidemic. We primarily, if you're just sort of an internet dweller, primarily hear all about the negative. And the truth is there are negative realities that come as a result of this. There's no question about that. However, what we want to do is take you to see and meet many of those that have come to faith so that you can see what God is doing. And this is really what it's all about, is in the midst of crisis, in the midst of what Satan is doing, we want to focus more on what God is doing and gain the ability to see 
to have eyes of faith and and discerning eyes and, and strategic eyes to see what God is doing. And God is at work. God is always at work. So that's another project. We'll probably have um, a series uh, or a, a primary video project to help bring you all and to see some of the fruit of what you all have been part of, uh, even over just the past couple of years. Okay, so that's one. Then, of course, there is this whole issue with Mount Sinai, and I know many of you have been tracking with this, and this has been burning on my heart all year. This is what I have been parked on all year. Now, let me just say this real briefly. Um, I am not incredibly sensitive when it comes to spiritual warfare. Um, you know, again, I'm more of the bulldog that just sort of grits his teeth and just pushes his way through things spiritually. Um, I'm not incredibly sensitive to these things, but I'll just say that this past year, in a very real, tangible way, has been the most difficult year that I can remember in terms of spiritual warfare. It has been really, really thick, and it's it's had all sorts of very real-world um, impact. You know, even I've, I've got some health issues, I won't share it with you, that are uh, kind of weighing heavy right now, and, and it's it's from health to this to that, that the, the warfare has been thick. So please do, I'm asking you all who watch the show, who are friends of the show, partners of the show, please remember to pray for the ministry and to all those that are partnered with us. Um, the warfare has been very, very thick, and I believe that much of it actually has to do with this project regarding Mount Sinai. Um, the warfare began the day that we started talking about this whole project, and it's been very, very heavy ever since. And just the way that things have unfolded, it was very clear that uh, Satan did not want to see this information and this project move forward. Okay, so first of all, I've talked a bit about the fact that I've been writing a book um, that deals with the location of the real Mount Sinai, as well as the story of the Exodus and how the story of the Exodus, in a very exciting way, is clearly the most dramatic type and shadow and pattern for the return of Jesus in all of the Bible. And so I've been working on that project again all year. However, in doing that, the first part of the book was intended to be a defense of the mountain known as Jebel al-Laz in northwest Saudi Arabia as the real Mount Sinai. This is the mountain that Ron Wyatt visited in the 1980s. Later, Bob Cornuke went and visited the mountain. Then during the 90s, you had Jim and Penny Caldwell got all kinds of wonderful uh, pictures and video of this and then shared it actually with both Ron and Bob. And, um, and as a result, many of you have seen videos and different things. Um, Ryan Morrow, by the way, uh, who works with Clarion Project, you sometimes will see him as a as a um, guest on some of the Fox News programs. He's actually released a short, um, it, it'll be a YouTube movie that will be coming out about the mountain. He's gone there a few times over the past few years, and he and I have been in dialogue. There's a lot that's swirling around um, behind the scenes that I can't really share everything concerning this mountain. Big things are about to happen over the next few years. But in any case, as I was writing this book, I felt as though it was necessary to break off the first part of the book, which again is the defense of Jebel al-Laws as the real Mount Sinai, as its own separate book. Because ultimately, the message that I've been most passionate about, which again is the story of the Exodus and how it ties into the return of Jesus, that's what I've been most excited about. I don't want anyone to sour on that or question the veracity of that message because maybe they disagree with my view concerning the location of Mount Sinai. I don't want that to take away from this incredibly beautiful, powerful message that is clearly there in the scriptures. So that said, I've broken off a book, and the title of that book is Mount Sinai in Arabia, The True Location Revealed. Um, but that book is all done, it's at the editors, and that will be out probably in December, maybe January at the latest. Um, this is probably the most comprehensive, published, popular treatment, okay, so for a wide popular audience, of uh, the defense of Jebel Allah's as the real Mount Sinai. This will be the first published, really, defense of it, that that's the primary purpose. I'm not just telling the story of me having gone, my adventures. I touch on that just a teeny tiny bit. Mostly it is just a systematic defense, because I know many of you out there believe this is the real Mount Sinai, 
And you see different things on the internet, you hear different things on the internet, and then you see criticisms of this view. And so I work through a lot of these criticisms. I work through the case for the mountain, again, from a traditional perspective, from a biblical perspective, from a geographic perspective, a geologic perspective, an archaeological. All of these different ways I work through it. I address the fascinating reality that Paul the Apostle, in all likelihood, did visit Mount Sinai after Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, and that is where the Lord revealed personally to Paul the fullness of Paul's gospel, that it was actually at Mount Sinai. And I address the fact that Paul, in all likelihood, would have most likely believed Mount Sinai to be there in northwest Saudi Arabia, based on the context of his time um, and from several different perspectives, whether biblical, whether traditional, that as a Jew, that this is where Paul would have believed Mount Sinai to have been. And so Paul himself is a profound witness concerning the fact that Jebel al is the real Mount Sinai there in northwest Saudi Arabia. So we deal with all of these things, um, but it's all laid out there in a, in a very readable, easily understandable format, and it's got all kinds of color pictures. So I'm excited about that book, okay? I'm very excited about it. And then finally, and I'll just touch on this briefly because this is becoming a long update, but the book that I'm most passionate about, again, is the book that deals with the account of the Exodus and how the covenant at Mount Sinai in so many, so many ways was a marriage covenant. It is structured and it uses all of the motifs of a marriage covenant. And the story of the Exodus is a magnificent and such a foundational story in the scriptures, but that that becomes the pattern, that becomes the foundation, that becomes the basis for the return of Jesus. And so we address the covenantal framework of why Jesus needs to return, what he is doing when he returns, and we tell the story of the triumphal procession of the Messiah from Sinai to Zion, from northwest Saudi Arabia to Jerusalem, where he will be established as the King Messiah over the land of Israel on the throne of his father David. And so the title of that book, now this is a book that is right now about halfway done. I've got about half of it written. It's all sketched out and framed out, but it's about halfway written. Ideally, this will be released in the early spring of next year. The title of this book, and again, I'll put up a picture. This could change by the time that we release it, but it's Sinai to Zion, the untold story of the triumphant return of Jesus. And again, this may be the most exciting, just powerful book that I've written yet. I am just, I have so much excitement and energy and just fire on this book that I can't wait to share it with you all. Again, the spiritual warfare has been thick, so please do pray for myself, pray for my family, pray for the ministry um, in the next few months as we go forward. Now, on top of all of this, um, let me just say that in the midst of all of these projects, obviously there are also tremendous financial burdens as we're shifting into self-publishing and, and sort of getting launched in all of this, some of these different projects, some of the international traveling projects that we want to do to accomplish all of this. So there are tremendous expenses. Um, the, uh, the support is down a little bit right now. Don't get me wrong when I say that. I am tremendously grateful for anyone that is partnering with the ministry, uh, anyone who is giving a one-time basis or on a regular basis. It really does mean the world to us. But please do consider becoming a regular supporter or making a one-time donation right now. We have uh, all kinds of projects. Again, all sorts of things in the hopper over the next year. I'm hoping to become much more prolific with this particular program and all sorts of other um, video content and so forth that we're really excited to begin moving on, uh, that we're putting the structure in place to give me a little bit more support um, so that we can be a bit more prolific and get that out there. But please do consider, prayerfully consider, becoming a regular supporter. Again, only if the Lord leads. Um, but if you're interested in becoming a regular supporter, again, or making a one-time donation, go to joelstrumpet.com, that's my website, and click on Partner. And from there, you have a few different options in terms of how you can support us so we can just continue to do what we're doing. So thank you so much. That's the ministry update for now. We've got a lot more uh, over the next few weeks and months that we'll be talking about. Um, but that is it for now. So with that said, welcome to the underground.
Welcome to this week's episode of The Underground, the program that explores the testimony of the biblical prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ, current events, and how all of these things relate to you and me. Now, in this week's episode, I just have something weighing on my heart. It's not a tremendously scripted discussion. I'm not even looking at notes or outline, but I just have something. It's a message that has been burning on my heart, and it's a message that I shared in Jerusalem this year, 2018, when I was there with the One King Conference, and it was sort of the first time that I got it out there, but I want to share it with you all. I want to share some of the thoughts that are burning on my heart, some of what I see as important, one of the more most prophetic yet applicational things that I could share right now. Now, Right now, at the time of recording this, last week was the Kavanaugh hearings. Now, there's suddenly all these accusers, you know, is Christine uh, Blasey Ford telling the truth? Did Kavanaugh actually sexually assault her in high school when he was drunk um, at a party and this sort of thing? And listen, I'm I'm just going to be honest. I personally do not believe um, that her full testimony that what she says that um, Kavanaugh did is true. I don't believe it. I believe there are just simply way too many problems with her story. That said, I'm not God, and neither are you, and none of us really ultimately know the truth. And so I've tried to keep my mouth shut and just sort of watch it from a distance prayerfully and focus on praying into this. But this is stirring up a much, much, much larger issue. Okay, so I'm not here to really even ultimately talk just about the Kavanaugh issue. But what this has revealed this past week, this incredibly contentious reality, this fight, this battle, this war over Supreme Court nominees in the United States is, and I'm going to say this, the United States right now is in the early stages of a cold civil war. Now, some people will get upset that I said that because they go, simply by saying it, simply by using that language, you are fomenting it, you are causing it to spread. No, we need to try to get ahead of this thing and stop it and stave it off. And I go, no, look, we have to acknowledge the reality that we're dealing with right now. We are in the midst of a, a, of a cold cultural civil war in the United States. Now, with that said, I believe that we are at a profound eschatological end time moment, and those of us with this sermon need to pay attention. So I'm going to begin by reading a couple verses. The first verse, the first passage, is in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, the words of Jesus. This is Jesus' sermon on the end times. So the Olivet Discourse, the sermon that was given on the Mount of Olives just before Jesus went on to the cross. It's really the final sermon in the Synoptic Gospels before he goes to the cross. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. And in Matthew 24, Jesus lists some of the primary signs and events that we should look out for as we approach the return of Jesus, as we approach that period leading up to the return of Jesus. So let me begin here in Matthew 24. I'm going to begin in verse 4. The the, uh, disciples had asked Jesus concerning the signs of the last days and of the end of the age, of his coming and of the end of the age. And beginning in verse 4, he says, uh, And Jesus answered them, See to it, first of all, that no one leads you astray. So look out for deceivers. Don't allow yourself to be deceived, either by deceivers, by false messiahs, by imposters, or simply by the lies of this current age, by the lies that we hear in the media, on social media, that are swirling out there just in the air, the the cliches that are popular. Don't allow yourself to be deceived. Be discerning. Understand the wiles, understand the schemes, understand the deception of the enemy, because he comes and he speaks in a way that seems right to man, but the end thereof is death. Satan always candy coats his poison. He doesn't come out with his bare, naked, wicked evil, otherwise no one would receive it. He always camouflages it, he always disguises it in such a way that it is palatable, that it is something that people will receive. Be aware of the wiles and the schemes of the enemy. Do not be deceived. Deception will be one of the primary defining characteristics of the days leading up to the return of Jesus. So see to it that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Verse 6, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, See to it that you're not alarmed. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid, for this must take place. The end is not yet. We're not there yet. 
wars, rumors of wars, all of these things. And then he says, for nation, this is verse 7, for nation will rise against nation. This is the part that I want to focus on. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And then he lists some of the primary classic signs of the last days. He says there's going to be famines, there's going to be earthquakes in various places. But all of these things are the beginning of birth pains. So the Braxton Hicks, these aren't the big, big contractions. These aren't the final contractions. It's not time to go to the hospital yet. These are just the beginning. These are the preliminary signs. So these are the things that we very well may see before that final seven-year period before Jesus returns. I believe that as we see these things increasing in intensity and frequency, all of them, and all of them together, we know that the return of Jesus is drawing close. It doesn't mean that we're in that final seven-year period, but I believe that we're moving in that direction. We're coming toward the end of the pregnancy. The birth is soon. The birth is drawing near. When the Braxton Hicks contractions begin, the beginning of birth pains, you know that pretty soon the real birth pains will come. But the, the primary thing that I want to zero in here is it says you will see nation rise against nation. Now, in the Greek, that word nation is ethnos. Okay, it's not goyim here. We're not in the Hebrew. It's ethnos. This is where we get the word ethnicities, okay, different ethnic groups. Now, in the ministry update here before this uh, episode began, I talked about the Balkans. Now, again, during the 1990s, um, you first you had sort of the uh, Yugoslavia. This was a lot of these nations in the Balkans were united under the umbrella of Yugoslavia. It was different things throughout history. It was sort of a, sort of a kingdom or a republic of Yugoslavia. Well, again, as a result of Satan getting his fingers into this part of the world, all of these different peoples who once were largely united under this singular umbrella began to be divided. And pretty soon the blood began to be shed, okay? And so eventually you had three separate wars, again, throughout the 90s. And you essentially have, in hindsight now, we've had over 150,000 people dead in that part of the world. Okay, so you had the Bosnian War. You had, we won't get into all of the wars, but the point is this. Satan got in. And he caused people to break up into increasingly hostile and smaller groups, whether it be ethnic groups, national groups, religious groups, any which way you can imagine. And so as a result of all of this, we now have all of these different nations. Again, Serbia, Slovenia, Slovakia, Croatia, Albania, Macedonia, you you know what I'm saying? All of these different, and they used to all be united, and they're all broken up. When the bloodshed begins to really spread then these divisions become even worse. Okay, so as a, as a result of that period of history in Eastern Europe, we now have a new term in our vocabulary called balkanize. Balkanize. Balkanize specifically means to break up into smaller and more hostile units. Okay, so you go, well, that was Eastern Europe. Here again, the former... Um, communist sort of part of Europe, you go, okay, well, that happened over there. Well, now step forward to the Arab Spring, 2011. The Arab Spring sweeps through the Middle East. Now, the political ideology that formerly held the Middle East together in many, many ways, it's called Arab nationalism. And we won't get into this in much detail, but essentially the idea is simplified is this. We are all Arab. You know, whether we're Iraqi, whether we're Syrian, whether we're Christian, whether we're Sunni Muslim, Shia Muslim, Alawite, whether we're Druze, it doesn't matter. We are all Arabs, right? And, um, and of course, usually, and Israel is our common enemy. So that was a, part of Arab nationalism was always this mutual, um, we all agree that Israel is, is the great enemy. And so through a, a common enemy, there's a, a degree of unity that comes with that. But the idea was that it's not so much about dividing over the whether you're Sunni or you're Shia or you're a Christian. They would say, we're all Arab and we need to stick together because your prosperity is my prosperity. When your group does well, my group does well. And, and so there's a mutually shared benefit to adhering uh, to Arab nationalism. And this is really the, again, political ideology that the various autocrats, the various Middle Eastern dictators, you know, we know them all, you know, Mubarak, Gaddafi, Assad, all of these different guys, Hussein, these guys used this to hold their very diverse nations together. They would appeal to this, and again, and they would appeal to that hatred of Israel. 
Well, with the Arab Spring, um, the Arab nationalism has sort of blown away. The winds of change have swept through the Middle East like an inferno, and most, most graphic, most the head of the spear of all of this culminated really in Syria. And so now I want you to pay attention. What began in Syria, what began in Syria as protests, primarily protests from the Sunni Muslims in the south that were unhappy with the way that they were be, being treated by Assad, the president of Syria, again, who is an Alawite Muslim. So Alawites are a small sect that are more closely related to Shia. That's the minority sect of Islam. So many of the Sunni Muslims were protesting because they didn't like the way they were being treated. There was sort of a call for justice, if you will. So really just a cry for justice eventually led to this harsh crackdown on behalf of Assad. And eventually this thing morphed, not from a protest into unrest, it eventually morphed into a full-blown civil war. Okay, and that, then the civil war morphed into something that is bordering on what could easily become a larger regional, and it did actually become a regional war when ISIS blows out of Syria and sweeps across northern Iraq. Um, but even larger than that, it's teetering, it has been teetering the past few years on a world war. Because now, today, 2018, October 2018, we have in the nation of Syria, we have uh, Russian troops, we have Chinese troops. We have American troops. We have, of course, Syrian troops. We have Al-Qaeda, ISIS. We have all of those different groups. We have Iranian troops. Among the Iranian troops, we have Afghanis. We have Pakistanis. We have all sorts of different people. We have Germans. We have French troops. We have Israeli troops. There's troops in there from Saudi Arabia, from the Emirates. Okay, so listen, there are people, there are foreign troops in Syria from all of the major nations all over the world. This began with protests. It began with protests. Okay, so we understand this side of it. Syria now has well over half a million people dead. The nation is in rubble. Large sections of the nation have been permanently, permanently destroyed. They will never be ever recovered to what they once were. Syria is a beautiful gem of a Middle Eastern nation. I've always wanted to spend time and really explore Syria. I will never be able to see Syria in terms of what it once was just 10 years ago. Tremendous biblical history, all sorts of uh, you know Middle Eastern history and ancient sites and so forth in Syria. And the people are beautiful and a diverse people. The nation is broken right now. Okay, so here's the thing. Again, as Americans, we can sit back and we can look at Syria. We can look at the Balkans and we can say, well, that happened over there. That happened over there. But that could never happen in the United States. That would never really get that out of hand as what we've seen over there in the United States. So this is sort of an underlying American privilege mentality. We think we're special, we're, we're kind of the anointed, we have, you know, we're not just this banana republic, we're not going to fall into that type of chaos. This is kind of the mentality that we sometimes get, and not, not often articulated quite that brazenly. This is sort of the attitude of Americans. Now, it's no secret, of course, that um, over the past several years, the United States has increasingly become far more politically polarized and divided. And I would argue that we always have been, and there's been a, a definite dramatic um, you know, rise of this over the past few years. Really during the Obama administration, I would say I saw it really ramping up. But there's no question that since the mo most recent presidential election, with an admittedly um, uh, President Trump can be pretty cantankerous. You know, he can really stir up conflict and controversy, and he doesn't mind picking fights and this sort of thing. And this has definitely stirred up and increased the political polarization. I'm not blaming it all on Trump. I'm just saying it has definitely occurred in concordance with the um, President Trump election and his election, of course, to the United States. It's just been incredibly controversial, incredibly polarizing. There's no question about it. But I don't think that any of us realized how bad it was. I mean, we knew it was bad, but we didn't realize quite how bad it was until we got to the Kavanaugh hearings. I've been looking at social media the past week. I've seen people 
referring to Republicans and saying, you know, these privileged white men, I can't wait till they're all dead and we dance on their corpses. You know, I mean, it's I've seen people say, give me one reason in the world why we shouldn't pursue these people where they live, where they eat, where they sleep, go after them. I mean, these are like communist, fascist. This is fascist language. Like, let's let's become physically violent with them, punch them in the face, this sort of thing. I saw some uh, and again, and these are. These are not just random people. These are like professors from Georgetown. Some of the some of these comments that I'm seeing on social media. I saw one, um, someone well placed in the media that said, "Women, if you have a husband that's a Republican, divorce him." You know, and so this is this is the type of preliminary atmosphere that leads to something that's much more than what we're seeing. This is why I called it a cold civil war. Now, I think. I would predict that in a few years we'll look back and we'll say, well, who was it? And why do I call it cold? Because there's not really blood shed yet. There's not a tremendous amount of blood that has begun to flow. However, I do believe that the language is there, the the um, emotions are there, and it's not long before we start seeing the blood begin to flow. With all that said, we have reached the place where the division, political division, ethnic tension, all of these things has reached fever pitch in our nation. Now, at any given point in history, technology has the ability to suddenly and quite dramatically transform things. And so I'm a big fan of Thomas Sowell. Some of you are familiar with Thomas Sowell. He's the uh, brilliant economist. He wrote the book Basic Economics, also Economic Facts and Fallacies, Visions of the Anointed. Um, a whole bunch of books. I highly recommend them. If you've never read Economic Facts, uh, I'm sorry, Basic Economics first, get that on Audible. I mean, I, I, I'm convinced that every high school student, every college student should have a primer in economics by listening to Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell. I mean, it's just so simple, common sense, easy to understand information. It's a lot of information. Get it on Audible and just listen to it. Now, um, if you understand economics, the way economics work, and it's not just business economics, it's any economy, social economy, you know, you name it. Um, when technologies change, Everything changes. So just as a classic example, we used to move all oil through barrels, and thus barrels barrels of oil is still sort of the standard for, of measurement. But there was a certain point where all of a sudden the Rockefeller family decided, hey, rather than having this very um, inefficient way of moving all this oil in barrels, we're going to put them in big oil tankers for trains. Well, this was a simple step forward in technology that radically transformed the transport of oil. It gave them the edge whereby they were able to now charge slightly less than their competitors. The Rockefellers went on to become one of the most wealthy, if not the wealthiest family in the world at the time. Those who were still doing it the old way, those who were behind the times using barrels, they were still probably in business for a few years before they finally realized that they had actually been dead men walking for a few years. This is the way a business economics works, right? Um, step forward, 1980s, Walmart burst forth out of Arkansas. Now they're importing very cheap manufactured products from China. And everyone goes, oh, no, but they're, and then they have this massive, incredibly convenient one-stop location. You can go in there, you can get bullets, you can get milk, you can get uh, pig's hoofs. I mean, you know, you name it, a bike, bike tire. Um, you know, candy bars, you can get it all at Walmart, you know, you can get anything you want. No, that's Alice's restaurant. At Walmart, um, Sam Walton, you know, he changed the way things are done. And what did everybody say? They go, but it's killing the mom and pop stores, right? Because we used to have the hardware store and the grocery store and this store. You had all these different things. They all started going out of business. Now, many of them stayed in business for five, ten years longer. They'd had been in the family for a long time, but they didn't realize that when Walmart came along, they were dead men walking in terms of business. And it's those that have the ability to understand how technology is changing their field, look forward to see the future, and then change accordingly that are the savvy business people. Right now, we're dealing with Amazon. Right, that, This is changing everything. Um, you name it. Let's just say you love your Captain Crunch. You can go on Amazon and you can get this button. I mean, you talk about technology, you talk about radical quantum leap. You can get a little button, you can put it in your cabinet, you can glue it up there in the cabinet, here's your Captain Crunch. You go up, the Captain Crunch is almost gone. You reach up there and you hit the button. That button will send a wireless signal. If you have Amazon Prime, um, it will 
immediately order you a new box of Captain Crunch, which will then be driven and shipped and dropped on your doorstep sometimes the same day, sometimes the next day. Again, if you have Amazon Prime, which is like $100 a year, free shipping. Um, you know, so whatever product you're talking about, that's crazy. This is, and you, they go, this is going to transform everything. And it is. This is even hurting, you know, things like Walmart, okay? If you're someone who is now competing with Amazon and you're not aware of how this is changing the way the world works, then you're a dead man walking. Now, what am I getting to? 15 years ago, I had a pager. I want to say it was about 15 years ago. I had a pager. Okay, so I had my own business for years. I was in the construction industry. I had a decorative painting contracting company. And my business partner and I would be driving around and the little ant ant vibrate on your hip. You would go, we would drive to a payphone. We would put quarters into the payphone. We would call the number on our little pager. We would write down the person's name and address. We would make an appointment. We would then go visit them, right? This is like, this is yesterday. This is crazy talk. What are you talking about? Something on your hip vibrated and you had to go to a payphone? Like, this is unfathomable in today's mentality. This was yesterday. Now we have these. The, the degree to which this is transforming and changing the way that mankind relates to one another. Most of us still haven't really figured it out. How this is going to impact the world in five years from now as we look back and go, wow, that phone thing really changed everything. Because growing up, the way everything worked with me is that I related to people primarily. Yes, there were phones, you know, again with cords, but I primarily related to people face to face. We also, if you had a, you know, whatever, you could do some stuff on the phone. But for the most part, 90% of the world, 95% of the world was done face to face. And life is different when it's done face to face. Okay. You see the person, you look them in the eye, there's an exchange, you know, that person, you know, their story. Again, you may not have walked a mile in that man's moccasins, but you may, you probably know them, you know, a little bit about their story, you know what they've been through. And so, you know, again, there's just a difference when you relate to face to face. Well, with this thing, this thing has burst forth onto the scene. And now we have something called social media, which is to say that these phones that we all now have, the increasingly large percentage of the world has, not only do we have access to information, but we, be, we are now relating to people primarily through these things and largely through Facebook, through Twitter, through Instagram, through social media. And the essence of the way that mankind is now relating is no longer face-to-face. -face. It is inherently distant. Now listen, why am I bringing all this up? This is an important end-time message. Please hear me. Jesus said the last days would be defined by ethnic divisions. I want to read another verse because I think it's relevant um, to this discussion. This is Galatians 3. Verse uh, 27, it says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Actually, let me, let me back up. Verse 26, For in Christ, Jesus, you are all sons and daughters, children of God through faith. So it's in Christ we are all children of God. We're all part of the same family. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. So, in Christ, he breaks down ethnic divisions, or at least it's intended to. If we're walking is the way that Paul the Apostle expected us to walk, as Jesus expected us to walk, then ethnic divisions are no longer relevant, right? And then it says, there is neither slave nor free. Now, this is socioeconomic uh, divisions, rich or poor. You know, this is another issue that people are trying to exploit to further sow division. Well, these rich people, all those poor people, and this sort of thing, and this has existed down through history. There's neither rich or poor, neither slave or free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So I'm convinced that Satan would love to divide, to balkanize the world. This is part of Satan's plans. This is part of Satan's 
strategy is to balkanize the world, to break us up into increasingly divided, hostile, smaller units between black and white, between Latino and different ethnic groups, between genders, male and female, rich and poor, different nationalities between Republican and Democrat, conservative and liberal, between right-wing extremist and radical left-wing extreme, and all of this kind of thing. And Satan is trying to make us believe that we are only on one extreme side that hates and wants to kill the other side and this sort of thing. This is the scheme of Satan. Now, going back to this, God did not so love the world. Please hear me. God did not so love the world that he texted us a very quaint message from his only son. He did not send out a Twitter 140-character message about how much God loves us. No, it says that he loved us so much that he dwelt amongst us. This is the incarnation. God in heaven, the glorious one who created everything, chose to take on flesh. And in Christ, it says in Philippians 2, that Jesus did not consider his godhood, his divinity, equality with God, something to be demanded, to be treated like God, to be grasped, to be seized. No, rather, he chose to become a servant. Jesus is the very embodiment of the heart of the Father. He took on flesh and he allowed himself to be humiliated, to be arrested and betrayed, to be tortured, to be mutilated for his enemies of which you and I all once were in order that he could make us into his sons and daughters, in order that he could adopt us into his family. He was mutilated for his enemies. And you and I, before we were in Christ, were his enemies. Every single one of us, if you're a believer watching this, you were formerly an enemy of God. And God demonstrated his love toward us and that he died for us sinners while we were still his enemies. And then we are called, Philippians 2, have in yourselves that same attitude as Christ Jesus. Have in yourselves that same attitude. We are called to imitate Jesus. The essence of who the God of the Bible is and has always been is the one that reveals himself, the one who draws near. He's always appearing. He appears to Hagar. He shows up. He's there with Jacob. He appears at the Exodus in the form of the pillar of cloud, in the form of the angel of the Lord, in the burning bush, and ultimately, and in the most ultimate sense, by taking on flesh. God has dwelt amongst us, face to face, panim to panim, right, in the Hebrew. And so we are called to imitate him, which is to say this, if we are aware of the schemes of Satan, we're aware of the lies that he's trying to spread. Now, I'm not telling you to throw away your politics. What I'm saying is that we need to prioritize our politics and our approach to the culture war in accordance to its importance as it relates to the gospel. What is more important, winning the culture war or losing your brother and sister? What does it gain a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? What does it mean if we win the culture war, whatever that means, and we have all these laws that are more Christian, but we compromise our behavior and our mannerisms and we call people idiots and fools, the very thing that Jesus said, don't do that. If you do that in anger, you're in danger of hellfire, even if people are dumb. He says, don't do that. Jesus says, don't do that. What does it gain us if we win the war, but we compromise our Christian values and we behave just like the world? Because that's what Satan wants to do is he goes, well, they act that way, so we can too. And on and on and on. That's a whole other issue. But the point is this. We have to recognize that this thing is completely transforming the way that mankind relates to one another. And we need to make a conscious, deliberate effort not to feed and foment the civil war. As followers of Jesus, our mandate is to bring about the reconciliation of all people, ultimately to God. But it's to fight against the schemes of the enemy, which says that we are all just on these radical extremes and we want to kill each other. No, ultimately, we may disagree. And I know this is primarily for Americans, but it, ap- it applies to a lot more than just Americans. But you know something? Whether you are a Democrat or whether you are a Republican, we're all Americans. That's the way it's always been for me. And you can have your opinion and we'll deal with it at the ballot box. 
but I don't want to kill you, and I certainly hope that you don't want to kill me, but that's where we're getting. And so we as followers of Jesus, we have better start paying attention to begin relating to people more face-to-face. That's incarnational living. Dwell amongst people. Become good listeners. Start learning how to listen to and see other people, right? What did Hagar say? She goes, I have now seen the one who sees me. God is the one who sees us. We are his children. We are his ambassadors. We are to be those who are good listeners, who see others. And stop fomenting the civil war on social media because this thing is Satan's instrument of anti-incarnational living. This is the opposite of the incarnation. This is the opposite of dwelling near. God came and dwelt amongst us. This is inherently distant. This puts a wall of separation where increasingly angry, hostile people just voice negative things and jump into the battle and think, well, I just have to voice this opinion or that, and that's somehow going to change things, and everybody wants to be heard, but very few people are good at listening. As followers of Jesus, we need to imitate him and learn how to be those who live incarnational lives and recognize that although social media has its place and purpose, it also has become a very valuable tool for Satan to foment the increase of nation against nation, of rich against poor, slave against free, women against men, this kind of thing that it's, we need to be aware of, discern of the, of the schemes and the wiles of Satan, and we need to not participate and allow ourselves to be pawns of Satan. Rather, we are to be children and imitators of God. Amen? So that's just something that's been on my heart. Uh, that's my prophetic word, if you will, in the aftermath of the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, I, I'm not, when I say that we're in a cold civil war, I'm not trying to make a prediction. I'm just telling you what I see right now. And I want to be part of Jesus' solution in the midst of the darkness. I want to be light in the darkness. I don't want to be someone that participates in further ripping the nation that I love apart. Yes, this nation has a lot of problems. There's no question about it, but it's also where I'm raising my children. It's where I have citizenship, and my job is to be salt and light here. And if you're a Christian and you're an American, then that is your main mandate as well. But again, our ultimate mandate is to... Is to proclaim the gospel and share the gospel and introduce people to this God. And we can't do that if we're not representing him well. So that's all we have. Uh, That's all the time that we have for this week. Again, I just needed to get that off my chest. Um, I think it's important. We'll talk more about that um, in the days ahead. But as I said, we've got all kinds of of big projects ahead. The warfare is thick. I do cover your prayers. Um, again, please do consider becoming a regular supporter. We, we need more regular supporters right now, and it means the world to us. But do pray again. You know, again, I always want to qualify. Only if the Lord leads you, um, do consider becoming a regular supporter. So thank you so much. Thanks for being with us. Look forward to seeing you here real soon. Until then, I'm Joel Richardson, and this is The Underground.